All right. All right, on with it. On with it. <laughs> sorry, I'm going to calls earlier. Yeah, it's okay. I was about to. I was about to say. I'm sorry. I hope I'm not blowing you up. You know, it doesn't tell me what happens on the other end. So yeah, uh, no. I was hoping you know. you'd blow me up more. I was, fuck the first one. Fuck miss the second one. Fuck with the third one. Sorry for the ass, but yeah, it's like there's no way to like get back a hold of them. There's like this. They say if you have an account, you can leave a message, but I still have like no idea if that's even like a legit thing. It, it actually is like, but it's it's generally not worth doing. Like, uh, there's there's a couple of people who set it up. I think it, it costs you like a dollar to leave me a message, and then when I go to make a phone call, like I can get it and I can say, okay, you know, if you want to get a message to me, that's fine. But since I don't like, since my access to the phone here is not so terribly restricted, it's just like whatever. I'll just call you a couple more times, and eventually I'll get you. You know. Yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, not a whole not a whole lot happening here. I was just uh, I was just remarking earlier. There's like they get a couple of guys came in here who like fucked up or on drugs or whatever, right? And they uh, and they're they're acting like savages in this cell. They're banging on the windows. They're spitting at people and da da. And I'm going nuts because <clears throat> because uh, they're like, all right, you just sober up and then we'll let you go. And I'm like, you motherfuckers, I'm in here. I'm like, I'm behaving myself. I'm reading books and doing push-ups. Waiting two months to show a judge the evidence that proves I'm innocent. <laughs> you guys come in here act like fucking savages. You get to leave in a fucking morning. <laughs> I think people have been keeping tabs on those who have been getting bail and bonded in Charlottesville since you've gone in there. And some of the, I don't even remember the specifics on some of the cases, but some people have been like people accused of rape and murder. Been let out on bail and, I don't know, what'd you do, Pepper? Oh. Oh, that's that's oh, that's fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm um, yeah, exactly. I'm accused of pepper spraying two people who I didn't pepper spray, and the evidence against me is that I pepper sprayed a different person. So, so that's uh, that's that's what I'm in here for. And yeah, I've seen a lot of people come and go while I've been here. I've seen people come, go, and then get back in here. I've been. I was listening to a, <laughs> twice today. You know, one just a little while ago. I hear a guy complaining. He's in the intake area, right? So everybody who comes and goes from this jail goes through the area that I'm in. And so I hear some guy out there while they're taking his picture. And for the second time today, I hear somebody bitching about, every time I come in here, y'all be like, (laughs) da-da-da-da-da. Just repeat, people are always in jail complaining about the service because of how fucking frequently they're in this place. And they're like, yeah, 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 go ahead. What would you do? You raped your grandma? Okay, yeah, here's your fucking sandwich. We'll see you in the morning. Goodbye. <laughs> get out of here. Yeah, Jesus Christ, dude. <sighs> Let me get your comments on this. Twitter recently banned Elizabeth Johnston, the activist mommy, for criticizing Teen Vogue's piece on how to have anal sex and for calling the publication a sodomite magazine. And apparently, (laughs) YouTube has completely demonetized her entire channel for these comments. So, if you criticize Teen Vogue for instructing young girls on how to have anal sex, you can get banned from Twitter and completely demonetized on YouTube. Yeah, well, I can't say, well, I I would say, I'm surprised you got, she got completely banned from Twitter, did you say? Completely banned from Twitter. That like for calling for calling Teen Vogue a sodomite magazine and being completely having the account deleted, I am a little surprised by that. Like I am not surprised at Teen Vogue doing this. I don't read a whole lot of Teen Vogue, but a young lady showed me a few pages of it one day while we were in the line at a supermarket. I was like, Oh my god, this is a teen magazine? I couldn't believe the degeneracy that they were promoting. Like and and it takes a lot to shock me, right? I do the radical agenda. It's literally my full time job to read about all the lunatic take asshole things that communists are promoting in our papers, and and I was shocked looking at uh, uh, just, I think they were, she was showing me some article about transgenderism or something like this, right? And I was uh, and I was and I was furious looking at it then, and now it's like okay, well, wow, now let's uh, let's give you a graphic depiction and a and uh, a how-to study guide on uh, on anal sex. And shockingly enough, a mother takes issue with uh, teaching their teen daughter that. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, it's, it's troubling. Demonetizing the entire channel, that's a new one. I mean, I had my entire channel deleted post Charlottesville, so I knew that YouTube was stepping up their censorship. But, I mean, even up until Charlottesville, I didn't have my entire channel demonetized. I got a lot of, vid- I got a lot of individual videos got demonetized. Um, well, I guess she's not the first. Uh, it's been happening to a lot of people on... Right. Uh, 
I'm sure you're familiar with Black Pigeon Speaks. He recently yeah. had 90 or 95 percent of his videos demonetized as well. So I think it's something that's it's like your it's like a first or second strike now at this point. It's the, it's the point before which they completely axe your channel. Uh, meanwhile, though, the the guy who wrote the article about how to have anal sex is still on Twitter. He even responded to her with a picture of two faggots kissing while giving them camera the middle finger so he's he's still there that's perfectly that's perfectly well i mean it's uh it is you know what i'll tell you what in a way it's a little bit refreshing right because like we've known this for a while right i mean i've been getting my 30-day bans from facebook literally every other month i just got off one years now yeah uh, you know, I've had four Twitter accounts deleted, and you know, people understandably assumed, well, this is just happening because Cantwell sucks, right? Cantwell's just this really over-the-top terrible person. It's not that they're taking a political side. A lot of people had this in their heads. Well, I mean, I think it's getting a little bit more overt at this point, right? Yeah, they're, they're gonna they're gonna eventually get to a point where they make it obvious that being being Mike Cernovich or Gavin McGinnis cuck style nonsense serves you no benefit. The reason that we're banning you is because it's in our political interest to do so. Go fuck yourselves. The Jews don't like you. Right? That is right. that is what is coming out on the social media now. And it's a shame it took so long, in all seriousness. You know, if, if they'd just been upfront about it in the beginning, the market alternatives would have popped up sooner and we wouldn't be dealing with this complete silence uh that is being imposed on our side. But now that they're making it more overt, you know, I do think that the, the hope I have anyway is that the market alternatives will emerge. People will see opportunity for profit and, and put up a competitor and, uh, and you know, we can further divide our society into armed camps of enmity. Well, it's, uh, it's tough, though, right, because you have Google or companies like Google and Apple that have essentially have a duopoly on the mobile firmware market thanks to me use the government to maintain that duopoly and then from there they have their app stores and they can prohibit anybody they want from their app stores so from you know from having a duopoly on firmware they have a duopoly on app distribution after that and those two stores if they, those two companies if they get together and say hey we want to shield i don't know facebook and twitter from competition and remove gab.ai from our app store we'll go ahead and do that and like you said, if maybe maybe if people had taken this a little bit more seriously before, we wouldn't be to this point now where we've got these mega giant corporations that have essentially cornered the market and made it impossible for their competition to do anything about it. Well, I don't know that it's impossible for their competition to do anything about it. It might be impossible for us to do anything about it before the next presidential election, and that's going to be very dangerous, right? This right. is what they're gearing up for, right? This is this is this is the 2020 election, okay? That's that's what we're dealing with, uh, you know. And to a lesser extent, you know, I mean, even next year, the house races yeah. and whatnot. You know, they're 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 preparing. They're trying to take. They're 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 moving their you know pawns and uh, pawns and pieces around the board here, preparing to regain control of the federal government. And they they are they, and and they're blowing their load to do it, right? Because it's not lost on them. This is the thing, right? Like, yes, you have these massive corporations that, you know, we'll, we will not be able to reach the same amount of people as them or whatever, and that will bring them some electoral victory. But it doesn't, like, it's like we do not need to gain the entire goddamn global market in order to make a profit, right? Somebody doesn't need no. to do that in order to make money. And so the, the Google doesn't have necessarily a, a monopoly on the firmware. I mean, somebody can somebody can take a Samsung phone and you know uh, and, and 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 flash it, right? Uh, or or other different phones. There's uh, there's I don't know that there's a uh, there's got to be open source CDMA well, I'm not sure and about hardware that. out there. I think right? Apple's kind of fucked the market and went to Congress, Library of Congress, and made it so that the licensing agreements on on those phones you essentially agree that you're not going to use anybody else's firmware and they use congress to enforce that so with apple i don't know how it is with android but with apple you're not even allowed to jailbreak your own operating system on your own phone that you own against the law well that's yeah that's well but that's also because apple is making the firmware and the hardware and uh, you know what i'm saying so that's a completely apple distributed device and you're entering into a contract and you buy it from them right when you buy an unlocked, you know, Samsung Galaxy S7, 
I don't, I don't believe that you are under any compulsion to do that. Now, is everybody going to do that? No. Apple is no. still going to dominate the market. Whatever, whatever Samsung puts out with its phone is still going to dominate the market. You know, there's Windows phones and they'll, maybe they'll dominate the market. Maybe somebody will maybe. install Linux on the Windows phone. I mean, there's options, right? It's never going to be that it's not going to be that mass market of awesomeness that we've enjoyed for so long, right? But right. If, once, you, once you alienate, when you alienate people, that's what I was saying the other day, is that the further, they, the, the further left that they're willing to attack on the right of center spectrum, the, the further they're going to push everybody to our side, right? The more, the more they attack people, you know, it's, like I said, it's perfectly fine for them to attack me because nobody gives a shit about me, okay? Once they start attacking Black Pigeon Speaks, once they start attacking, you know, the mommy activist or whoever it is, you know. Lauren, who, take Lauren who, Southern who, off of uh, Instagram or whatever, you know what I mean? There you go. You're going to ban Lauren Southern, Augustus Invictus. You're going to ban, uh, who's next, you know? You know, Seven Kalki, Adam Tom Kokesh, Wood. you know. Molyneux, Woods, you know. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what. There you go. You get Once they get Molyneux and Woods, believe me when I tell you, the militancy will grow like yeah, well, you wouldn't believe. Yeah, well. And then people are going to be like, okay, well, I'm ready to lay down my life and take up arms. I might as well flash my smartphone. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, you've, <laughs> so, already, you've, already, you've already become a meme in this regard. People online are saying, first they came for Cantwell, and I said nothing because I was not Cantwell. And I mean, yeah. like people should have fucking been paying attention earlier. It wasn't just that you were an unsavory character, so to speak. It was, I mean, dude, maybe maybe you are a little rough around the edges, right? A little crude sometimes, but your points are valid, and they're not banning you because you're crude or because you're using profanity. They're banning you because it's a political agenda, and they're yeah, on the exactly. opposite side. If I was being if I was being crude and using profanity while I was promoting Judaism and homosexuality, I'd be the king of Facebook right now. Instead, right. I'm. Oh, Netflix promoting right wing shit. You'd have a stand up comedy on Netflix. You'd have a special on Netflix doing stand up. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I if I had been doing that, I would. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So that's exactly what it is. And so all these people are like, yeah, I don't care because you know Cantwell, uh, you know Cantwell rubbed me the wrong way at some point in the you know eight years he's been at this. Uh, so I don't care what happens to him. Well, you know now, now you're now you're watching it happen, and eventually it will get to. Uh, it, and eventually it will get to guys like Woods and Molyneux, and eventually, uh, you know, eventually it'll be other people in these goddamn boxes instead of me. And then, you know, it, it's a matter of how long, how much of that, how how many, how far to the left will they go with that nonsense before people, you know, say, okay, uh, this will be this will be handled by sword, <laughs> you know, or this will be, or now I'm ready to go to the market competitor, you know, however difficult and 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 cumbersome it may be to do. Well, the right? market's done it before. So, We've all gone from MySpace to Facebook at one point in time. I would, be, I, I mean, I highly doubt that Facebook is the last, be, the last stop on social, social media, the end all be all of social media. You know what I mean? So, you're right. Yeah, it can't be. It can't be. And what will eventually happen? The social media thing. My prediction, honestly, is it'll go peer to peer. I think that that's really what it has to, I really think that's what it has to be, you know, and I've been sort of trying to push that for a little while. Like, one of the, one of the things that I had on my very long to-do list was to put up a diaspora pod and also a, uh, a GNU social server, which are not perfectly peer-to-peer -peer systems, but they are, but they are decentralized insofar as I can have a server, you can have a server, and, and you know, Mark Zuckerberg can have a server, and we're all communicating with each other's users at the same time. And so that, that decentralizes it in such a fashion as, you know, um, you know, maybe the guys at the Daily Stormer have one up, and they're going to be like, okay, all the Nazis can hang out here, and the commies can bitch about us all they want, but they can't get us kicked off, right? And right. so that's, that's what I think really needs to happen. There's another one called Twister, which is like a Twitter-using blockchain. It was very cumbersome. I didn't think it had very high hopes. We're going to get cut off, so I'm going to call you right back, okay, bud? Okay. All right, I'll call you right back. All right, you with me? I am with you, and we, and we are back. Uh, we have a quick word from our sponsor before we return for your regularly scheduled program, because I know a lot of you guys are really short attention spans, so you don't wait until the end. So let me just tell you, my Patreon is online. Patreon, that Patreon, Patreon is for kikes. 
I have Patreon up, and you can get that. Uh, you can go and search for Radical Agenda or Christopher Campbell on there. You can get the link at ChristopherCampbell.com. Where there are all the other ways that you can give me your shekels, Gloria. I mean, I really fucking need them because I'm in this box, and it's going to be really expensive for me to like show this judge the absolute proof that I'm not guilty of the crimes that I've accused of. So I want you to go ahead and do that so that uh, we can keep this thing going, and I don't lose everything I have while I wait for my uh, justified release. Um, uh, and, no, chances they, are, if you're listening to this, that's probably not in your best interest. So do what he says, give him some money. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, before, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, first they came for Canva, right? And <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah, we was talking about the social network thing, though, and I really think, I've said for a while, you know, I think it needs to go in a in a more peer-to-peer direction. I don't know, have you ever looked into any of the things I was just talking about, GNU Social or, or Diaspora or anything? Never even heard of them. Okay. I would encourage everybody who's listening to this, particularly if you're like a technically inclined person, maybe you've operated a website or two, like, I think that that's something that's just, some, it's wait, you're just waiting to make money on it, frankly. You could even just do it with, like, you, like, I think that you could realistically put, like, affiliate ads on something like that. And the, the cool thing about it, the, the diaspora kind of looks a lot like Facebook, really. Um, and it even has the ability to link to your Facebook and Twitter accounts. So when you post to Diaspora, it'll cross-post your Facebook and your Twitter, so you're not losing those feeds if you're still allowed to use them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it, and and the cool thing about it is, is that let's say you have like uh, it, it's not perfectly peer-to-peer in that you're you're on somebody the, these pods are servers that anybody can set up and connect to the network. So the pods are peers, but you are a user of a pod, right? But you can take your information off of your pod and then go to another pod. You can leave one server and go to another server. So let's just say that you you sign up for a server with, the, let's, say the, let's say the Daily Stormer says, I'm going to set up a Diaspora pod. And you're on the Daily Stormer Diaspora pod, and you're having fun, and you're shitposting with your friends, and you decide to read DOS Capital, and you decide, you know what, I'm a, I'm a commie faggot now. I'm going to jump ship. And we was like, yeah, we're not into the whole free speech thing over here, really. We were just trying to get our thing out there. So fuck you, commie, get lost. You can go pick up your pod. You can pick up your profile, and you can go over to the commie faggot pod with all the other degenerates who are posting Teen Vogue articles about anal sex with teenagers. <laughs> and 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 it's and it's perfectly fine. And you don't lose everything the way you do when Mark Zuckerberg decides he doesn't like your politics. Um, similarly. And GNU Social. Now, I don't know that GNU Social allows you to move from one server to another so easily, but it is like it's more like a Twitter clone than a Facebook clone. And this one, it even has like hashtags, right? So if, uh, let's say the Daily Stormer sets up a GNU Social server, um, it connects to the other servers. And the fun thing about GNU Social is it was set up by lefties, so they are already on there with their little hashtags about, I don't know, workers' rights and uh, uh, transgender bathrooms and whatever. So if they're on a hashtag about how wonderful it is being transgender, you can go and start posting gas chamber memes, and you, and the degenerates will see them, and you control them, just like you do on Twitter today. And that's the fun of it. Too, right? What's that? That's the fun of it, too, right? So with, like, gap.ai, you go on there, and you're like, holy shit, this is just a right-wing echo chamber, and I'm... You're never going to get into any trouble or fun over there. But exactly. GNU, it sounds like they've got a bunch of people that would be, uh, uh, they're ready to get butt hurt. Exactly. And so the, and so the thing that you have there, and, and I really do think that, you know, the, the problem that you have, and this is why I never gave any money to Gab.ai, right? Because these guys raised a million dollars for a free speech platform. And as soon as, they're, as soon as their registrar threatened them, they were like, you got to delete your tweet, Anglin, Right. It's like, wait a second, you just raised a million dollars. Go start a registrar, asshole. You know, do you, you, you want to start a free speech platform? You didn't think that this was going to happen eventually, that somebody was going to coerce you? That's the whole entire point here. You know, now I understand they've, you know, come to terms, whatever it is, whatever it is, they're working on it. But this, you can't have a centralized platform that, ha- that is in control of somebody who's trying to make a buck and think that somebody's not going to interfere with their money making as soon as you say something that upsets them. Especially when you talk about Jews. Yeah, well, I mean, especially when Jews are financing the whole thing, or you know, his name is Mark Zuckerberg or something like that. Why would he let you talk about it? Exactly. You know, and what? Yeah, why would he? Right? 
Like if I look, I'll tell you, this is why I don't. I, don't, I have never made. Like I don't want to say never, but oh my, I, I want to say you've never seen me make a big stink out of free speech, okay? Because even when I got kicked out, when I got kicked out of the Free State Project, all these people tried to come to me about free speech, free speech. I'm like, this isn't free speech. I'm like, this they they they're a little club. They don't want to invite me to their party. They don't invite me to their party. I think they're fucking losers, you know. But that's nothing to do with free speech, you know. So Mark Zuckerberg has all of this at his disposal, and you think he's not going to use it to his political advantage, you're out of your mind. If I was in control of Facebook, do you have any idea the terror that I would rain down upon my enemies? <laughs> you're crazy. Of course he's going to use it for his advantage. No, I mean, why wouldn't you, man? Especially with how you've been treated. You would have to be completely insane to get a hold of something like that and not be like, all right, I'm going to completely ban everybody left of Bernie Sanders from using this platform. Yeah. I mean, yeah. What they the do only reason pick. the only reason he tolerates any dissent whatsoever is to keep you on the platform listening to the propaganda of your foes. You well know? that that and you'll self censor, right? So they hit you with a thirty day thirty day bans and a clip and you go, Oh, well maybe I'll modify my behavior so that this doesn't happen again. So it's like this Orwellian uh <laughs> relearning program, except you're the one reteaching yourself the dog whistle, essentially. It's not like you're, you're going to, well, maybe I'm a fucking racist, or maybe I'm homophobic, so I shouldn't say these things on Facebook. No, that's not going to happen. You're just going to say them in way, say those types of things in ways that the, your audience can understand, but that leftists can't. Yeah, and that's that's the thing, right? I used to say that too. Like, like uh, uh, Facebook is in a sense worse than Twitter because Twitter is, uh, would at least delete your account and be like, "You're not welcome here." Whereas Facebook would be like, "Okay, no, we'll hold your audience hostage for 30 days while you think about what you've done and see your right. traffic stats decline. And when you come back, you'll behave a little bit better, you know. And certainly, you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, I still managed to say all the horrific things that I wanted to say, but I had to get more clever about how I said them. No doubt, you know. Um, and at the end, they didn't even like that. Wasn't even enough because they still took your Facebook profile from you and well, decided exactly. that they were like, "This guy's dog whistles are getting a little loud for our taste." <laughs> yeah, this guy's got fifteen, twenty thousand followers on Facebook, and he's getting a hundred shares on all this stuff. Maybe we should uh, do something about this. Yeah, exactly. You know, and they had depressed. You know, they had the Christopher Cantwell the website Facebook page, and that thing. They had, they had totally dampened that. Like, that was like, I, I've, I've been at like 13,000 followers on that thing for the better part of two years. And yet it says, you, you gained 50 followers this week, 50 likes this week, 100 weeks this week, likes this week. How am I getting 50, 100 likes a week? And, and my, and my follower count does not go from 13,000 to 14,000. It's complete Ever. bullshit. They're suppressing yeah. me. Yeah. So well, I, I know I they are because I have fucking... profile they didn't do that as much with, and I had the check mark and stuff there. So I mean, I was a verified profile and everything with you know five thousand friends and, and twenty thousand followers, and uh, they were like, okay, yeah, you've you've had enough. Uh, we've done enough to in, in, increase your profile. Now you now you're on the television set. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I know they're throttling you too. Because over the last few days, I've been recording these conversations and posting them. The first one, I've just been going to YouTube because my YouTube channel is brand new and fresh and no strikes or whatever. So first one was fine. Got a couple thousand views on YouTube. Got mirrored to a bunch of channels. Got shared on Facebook. You know, whatever. Doesn't share. The second one I posted, there an error has occurred. We have an, we have experienced an unexpected error. Then the video wouldn't post. I posted it to a page that had 10,000 likes. Uh, 10,000 followers, and it showed the post to five people over the course of three hours. And the average wow. the average viewership per post on that page is like 10 to 20,000 people. So, yeah, I don't know. This is the only post that this has ever happened on. Uh, yeah. I don't think it's just a coincidence. Yeah, you know what I'll do? when we, well, I'll, We'll run this recording out, and I'll call you back. You don't turn on the recorder, and we're going to make another arrangement. We'll get, we'll get it out there another way. I've been, um, I've been speaking with somebody who's... Uh, has access to your website. We've been mirroring it over there as well to make sure that this is getting out to people. I've been dropping it in the right stuff. Listener group and your uh, Discord channel there. So we, we've been making sure that it gets out. 
Okay, excellent, excellent, excellent. Yeah, I uh, what do you call? I'm I'm glad that you guys are working hard to to make sure that the voice gets heard because you know that that's exactly what they've got me in here for. You know, they're they're trying to prevent it from happening and and uh, and they are failing magnificently, uh, as it were. So it's a good thing that uh, whatever whatever technological problems we have, uh, they haven't they haven't decided that I can't make phone calls yet. So. Good, good to be good able to uh, have some have some interesting people on the outside willing to have a conversation with me. Help me kill a little time in this shit all and entertain the masses. Well, I'll give you something to look forward to, right? Because, I don't know, dude, I, I can't even imagine, but being locked up in there, you know, when you're used to having social media and access to the Internet and all that sort of shit, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you can have just information withdrawal alone, you know what I mean? So it's definitely my pleasure to help get your voice out there and, like I said, last time I spoke with you, I've been soliciting recommendations. So if there's anything people want to hear you talk about, just have them tell me, and I'm trying to bring it up to you as I talk to you. Maybe get enough content to form them into episodes of Radical, of the Radical Agenda. You know, yeah. like I said, I've been the, uh, what do you call it? it is, you know, I got to tell you, it is. It, it, there's a certain component of it that is a little bit nice having the the, the social media withdrawal. You know. I mean, my life is full of constant fucking stimulation, right? And, you know, that's fun, right? Uh, you know, it's exciting. Like, people always, you know, the social media, the phone going off, you know. Uh, you know, not, uh, I don't know if I talk about women, but you get the idea, right? Yeah. You know, I have, I, I, my, my life is very exciting. And any time, and, and in, the, in, all, in the course of all that excitement, five minutes of boredom feels like a lifetime, right? Right. And, it is, and it's actually like there's a very, there's a certain sense of uneasiness that comes with that. And I'm sure a lot of people who are listening to this, maybe even yourself, can relate to that. That like, that, what do you mean? There's nothing going on for the next ten minutes, Blah, right? Well, you look at it from like biochemical level too, and every single notification you get on social media, like that's an endorphin hit. You know what I mean? So the, the moment you don't have that five minutes without endorphin hits, you're like, holy shit! <laughs> that's what the exactly. real world is like, yeah. Yeah, and now it's like, you know, like I pace back and forth in this cell and I read and like like I was like I wanted to read more when I was at home, you know, like I think I probably already said this to you, but like, you know, I would read the the news every day, but I didn't I didn't have an, I, I I it was difficult for me to make time to read a book. And and I read, you know, in the last couple of years I had read, you know, Democracy the God that Failed, RK Selection Theory, the the evolutionary psychology behind politics. Yeah. Um, uh, higher superstition and uh, the academic left and the quarrels with science, etc. So I read these books and they like drift out and really changed my opinions very dramatically in a very short period of time. And I wanted to continue reading. I was trying to get through Mein Kampf and you know, and it took me like I was having trouble motivating myself to read the book. And then I finally started listening to it. And I I had read, I started to do the the uh, the Turner Diaries, and I actually finished that on the way down to Charlottesville. And so. I didn't. I, I, I wanted to read more, and I hadn't been able to make myself stop all the constant stimulation to sit and read a book because it just felt like such a slowdown in my in the pace of my life that it was you know weird. And so being in here, especially since I didn't have anything to do for the first you know week or so, like I, I went completely nuts. I was completely isolated. I had nothing to read save for the inmate Why handbook and. And then once I got my books, it was like this huge stimulation. I just I've, I've gone through I've gone through seven books in two weeks, not the least of which was Culture of Critique, which is long. I finally finished that one. Now I'm reading something, uh, God's Battalions: The Case for the Crusades by Rodney Stark is a, a, it's turning out to be a fascinating read so far. I've just gotten started, but. Uh, you know, you hear this thing about, oh, this crusade is why the Muslims hate us. It's all your fault, you Christian white racist bastards. <laughs> it's like, no, they were fucking conquering the fucking planet, and we had to fucking put a stop to it. Thank you. And yeah. so it's, uh, yeah. it's, 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 it's a lot of fun uh, getting, uh, shall we say, a little bit better educated. I'm gonna, we're going to get caught off. I'm going to call you back. Don't start the recording right away, and then we'll pick it up, okay? All right, Chris. All right, bye. Thanks. No. All right, and we're back. All right, welcome back to the uh, to the radical agenda or whatever it is that we're calling this these days. Uh, so here, <laughs> let, me, let me read to you this this piece from this book that I'm reading. It's so much fun. Like getting getting a little historical background and some foundational stuff. I like I really can't recommend this highly enough for people because 
you know, like I, I, I've said on the radical agenda before that like sometimes my lack of formal education shows that I get embarrassed about it. But it's been nice that I have like people calling in who are who are more informed. You know, I love when I do like the like the what would Hitler do segments with Hatting, and right. really I think I have a lot of political disagreements with him. He's a really smart and informed guy, and so it's good to be able to get some 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 stuff underneath me here. You know, well, I made, they're, I made they're nuanced like, uh, disagreements too, right? They're not just like basic bitch talking points. So when you guys get into it, it's actually like, all right, this is what you know, like let. I don't want to call him a leftist, but he does actually bring up some leftist talking points with regard to economics. So, but he's serious about it. You know what I mean? So when you guys go head to head with each other on that, you actually get something out of it instead of just people calling each other racist. You know what I mean? Exactly. You know exactly. And so you know, while I while I have some like, and so for example, you know, I read this I read this Hitler's Revolution book while I was in here, and so like I really just did not know much about the economic policies of the Reich, you know, and I would have to take Hatting at his word for these things. Not that I think that he would deceive me, but uh, someone's perspective dictates what facts they present, right? Right. And so. I, I did I read this Hitler's Revolution book which which contained some some really informative stuff about the economic policies of of the Hitler administration and it's and it's interesting and so like I'm I'm glad to be gaining this foundation having some reading some some more books because like I said I mean th- those 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 two or three books that I just mentioned before you know uh, evolutionary psychology behind politics ten thousand year explosion uh, higher superstition and their quarrel, uh, academic left and their quarrels with the, the science and um, and, uh, democracy. and democracy, the God that fails. Those those four books right there totally changed my foundations, right? And so now I've been in here and I read uh, Hitler's Revolution, the culture of critique. Um, well, hello, you still there? I'm here. Okay, yeah, sorry, my phone clicked there. Um, what do you call it? Skinhead Confessions. And uh, and now I'm reading this. Uh, well, I've read some James Bond books too, which are not going to be particularly useful for the. Uh, for the, for the radical agenda, and if somebody gave me egalitarianism or his revolt against nature and other essays, Murray Rothbard, and I'll tell you what, egalitarianism is a revolt against nature. It was one of my favorite Rothbard essays ever. And after I finished reading Culture of Critique, I was so angry, I was so mad, and I was like, all right. Before I do something terrible or say something really terrible, maybe I'll go read some stuff from my favorite Jew. And so I started reading from <laughs> – you know, not not um, that essay. What was the one that I started reading? I read – what did I read today? I read um, – let me pull out the table of context here. What is it like in the um, same vein, like right-wing populism? It was – I read Left and Right and the Prospects for Liberty – and the anatomy of the state I read today. Now let me just read to you because this is when you start. I want to do like uh, you know it'd be really fun if somebody did like uh, I don't know a a Murray Rothbard through the eyes of an anti semite book or something, right? Because because here's let me just read. I was going to read from this. Sure. So many fucking things to read here. Um, okay. Uh, the conservative has long been marked, whether he knows it or not, by long run pessimism by the belief that the long-run trend, and therefore time itself, is against him. Hence, the inevitable trend runs toward left-wing statism at home and and communism abroad. It is this long-run despair that accounts for the conservatives' rather bizarre short-run optimism, for since the wrong run is given up as hopeless, the conservative feels that his only hope of uh, success rests in the current moment. In current affairs, this point of view leads the conservative to call for desperate showdowns with communism, for he feels that the longer he waits, the worse things will ineluctably become. At home, it leads him to total concentration on the very next election, where he is always for hoping for victory and never achieving it. The quintessence, uh, the quintessence of uh, quintessence the of the practical man, <laughs> uh, and the and beset by long run despair, the conservative refuses to think or plan beyond the election of the day. Pessimism, however, both short run and long term, is precisely the prognosis of the conservative deserves. For conservatism is a dying remnant of ancient regime of pre-industrial era, and as such, it has no future. Its contemporary American form, the recent conservative revival, embodied in uh, embodied the death throes of an electably moribund fundamentalist rural small town white Anglo-Saxon America. Did, uh, was first, there, wait, 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 wait! You're, you're reading Rothbard or Richard Spencer? I was just reading. I was just reading Rothbard, <laughs> and I got angry like you wouldn't believe because he's like, "Yeah, that's right. 
white Anglo-Saxon America, you're done. And I was like, you cock motherfucker. Wait, wait, wait. He was, <laughs> he was, he was blaming white Anglo-Saxon America? It's, no, he's... No, no, not blaming. He's saying it's over. He says, he says, oh. he says, pessimism is exactly what the conservative should have because, because it is the death throes of an electably moribund fundamentalist rural small town white Anglo-Saxon America. That's what he calls conservatism. And I got so fucking mad because you know I'm realizing that this is a a resource competitor of a de- different species in my homeland right and, and i'm becoming angry at him for for cheering the death of my people right and i went through this whole thing like it was like the, the the title of the essay i was just reading from is left and right the prospects for liberty and i wanted to see cuz when i was reading more rothbard when i was really heavily into libertarian literature i started getting in my head that left and right was this scam that was pulled over our eyes by the government right and so when I saw, you know, egalitarian is a revolt against nature and other essays show up in the mail here, I was like, oh, well, I love egalitarianism as a revolt against nature, but I've read it literally a hundred times and a few times on the air. And so I don't know, but I went, I looked at the table of contents and I saw that one. And I said, oh, let me read this. What is Rothbard's ideas on left and right? And it was the most <clears throat> annoying fucking piece of shit I've ever read, if I'm honest it's, with you. And it's not that I want to completely throw... It's so strange because Richard Spencer says, and even you know Sven from over at the Daily Show, they say the same thing about conservatism and how it's failed rural white well, America and how it well, has no future. I, I don't get me wrong. I get well. I, I imagine that Richard Spencer and Mike Enoch are saying this in a different context than Murray Rothbard, right? It, well, it, and, yeah. and by yeah, the way, yeah, yeah. And, and and he's because he's talking. What he's talking about is not conservatism as the conservatism that I presently hold in contempt today. I uh, read out loud a piece with Mike Enoch a few days ago that I had written titled um, um, Conservatism's Betrayal of the Right. And I says, well, if conservatism <clears throat> is conserving the institutions that, the, that, our, that our rivals have perverted and built up around us like walls of a prison, then this is not something that I think of as particularly right-wing. If they want to say that the Roosevelt administration, the, the, the uh, FDR, not, not Teddy, uh, you know, gave us the New Deal, but they think that it's really great to virtue signal Adolf Hitler by calling him a socialist and thinking that the one good thing that fucking FDR did was get us into World War II, well, this is conserving the lies of our enemies. And that is something that I don't particularly care for in the terms of conservatism. But what he goes through in here, his, his concept of left and right is what I'm getting at. And maybe if, if, if one reads the whole essay, you'll see what I'm talking about. That his concept of left and right is so infuriatingly, in my mind, deceptive that I, I, I come to think that he's doing something bad, frankly. And I, and, I don't, and I don't generally think that about Murray Rothbard. Maybe it's just because I had literally just put down culture of critique and I was rather untrusting of Murray's people at the moment. <laughs> when was this piece written, though, in, in Murray's career? Was it, like, toward the beginning, the middle, or toward the end? It, it's interesting that you ask that because I asked myself the same question, and I do not find that stated in the book, sadly, so... Um, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe the uh, I leave that as an exercise to the listener. Uh, to yeah, I'm going to see if I can find that. that because we all know yeah. that Murray was kind of a pussy when he wrote for a new liberty, right? So, like in the middle of his career, after he got kicked the fuck out of the National Review, he kind of went a little soft in trying to appeal to the left because he didn't have the internet; he couldn't just network with right right wing people. Yeah. But then he kind of, you know, but in the like, 90s. But even, like, he does this, like, thing, like, I don't know. It's just he's all over the place with what is left and what is right and how left and right have shifted. And, like, I understand that there's a, there's a context to say that what is left and what has right has shifted. But I feel like he was doing it, as a lot of people do, in terms of what the political parties were advocating in the moment, right? Which right, I do yeah. not think I do not think of as a good way to describe what is left and what is right. Well, no, I if you look that, at their you know, political parties, that's a good way to describe what is left and what is lefter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and especially after, you know, especially after reading Culture of Critique, when you realize that, like, okay, when when you realize that Jewish money is, like, uh, like 75% of what funds Democratic races and, like, 25 or 30% of what funds Republican races, 
you're like, oh, okay, no wonder everything is left and lefter. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's that. In any case, so what I, all right, so before I started reading from Rothbard, I wanted to tell you about this other thing. So, so I, I was reading the God's Battalion, The Case for the Crusades by Rodney Stark. Thank you to whoever sent this to me. It's, a, it's an excellent read. And uh, it, 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 a portion of the beginning of it goes, Two months after the attack of September 11, 2001, on New York City, former President Bill Clinton informed an audience at Georgetown University that, quote, those of us who come from various European lineages are not blameless vis-a-vis the Crusades as a crime against Islam, and then summarized a medieval account about all the blood that was shed when Godfrey of Bouillon and his forces conquered Jerusalem in 1099. That the Crusades were a terrible crime in need of atonement was a popular theme even before the Islamic terrorists crashed their hijack airliners. In 1999, the New York Times had solemnly proposed that the Crusades were comparable to Hitler's atrocities or to the ethnic cleansing in Kosovo that same year to mark the 900th anniversary of the Crusader conquest of Jerusalem. Hundreds of devout Protestants took part in a reconciliation walk that began in Germany and ended in the Holy Land. Along the way, the walkers wore T-shirts bearing the message, I apologize in Arabic. Their official statement explained the need for a Christian policy uh, apology as follows. 900 years ago, our for- <clears throat> I should do it this way. 900 years ago, our <laughs> forefathers carried out the name of Jesus Christ in battle across the Middle East. Fueled by fear, greed, and hatred, the Crusaders lifted the banner of the cross above your people. <laughs> On the anniversary of the First Crusade, we wish to retrace the footsteps of the Crusaders in apology for their deeds. We deeply regret the atrocities committed in the name of Christ by our predecessors. We renounce greed hatred and fear and condemn all violence done in the name of Jesus Christ oy oh vey oy vey <laughs> inserted by me of course um, so like you hear this from time to time it was something I never knew about right I never understood and I still don't I'm only like 50 pages into this book I didn't know anything about the crusades so people were like yeah the crusades I was like yeah yeah the religious people were terrible no Bali right? has a piece on this it was a response to the Muslim invasion of Europe Essentially, they were going further and further into Europe. They had uh, 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 sex slave trades, human trafficking, all kinds of shit, dude. They were brutally just slaughtering people as they made their way into Europe. And uh, the Europeans sat on their laurels for years, and eventually they were like, all right, we got to fucking go in. We got to do something about this. And the, the Crusades... And we're back. All right, yeah. So, uh, yeah, as you, as you were just pointing out, I haven't. I don't think I actually watched the uh, the Molyneux presentation on this, but it'd probably be a good thing for me to get through. And those of you who don't have the time to to read this fantastic book, I think it's probably a thing worth uh, worth taking a look at. Uh, no, yeah, well, they but, teach you in uh, public school, right? They teach you in public school that the Crusades are like this unilateral thing, like this war of aggression where the Christians just went in and slaughtered a whole shitload of Muslims. <laughs> Come to find out, that's not what happened. <laughs> Why yeah. would they lie to and, me in public school? That's the yeah. first time that's ever happened. And, and I've heard, like, you heard Barack Obama say this, you know, the Crusades or whatever. And she's like, everybody just accepts that, you know. And I, I don't even know that, I don't even know that I got taught this in public school or whatever. I mean, I, you know, I was a 10th grade dropout, you know, but I don't, I don't even remember any education about this. All my life, I just remember the Crusades as being this go-to example of bad things Christians did or whatever. And yeah. since for much of my life, I was like an atheist who was, you know, hostile towards all religion. You know, I was perfectly happy to run with that narrative and just, you know, I just couldn't sure, pretend yeah. that the Muslims were any better. Right? I was just like, yeah, the Muslims are savages, so are the Christians. Everybody who believes in God is an asshole. Which <laughs> was my, my entire attitude about stuff. But yeah, but so I'm now, uh, you know, realizing that, uh, shall we say, not all superstitions are created equal. And I'm, uh, and I'm going through this book, and like, I'm only a little bit, a little bit of the ways into it. You know, when the Muslims finally make their way to Constantinople, you know, and it's like, yeah, there's probably like, there's there's just been a complete run, you know. These guys have completely had their run with, you know, they met their opposition along the way, but this is not people invading their goddamn homelands. They're taking over places that I today think of as fucking white countries, you know. Yeah. I don't. I don't particularly feel good about that, and I'm and it's occurring to me that at some point in the course of this book, I'm going to start realizing, oh, that's why these people have slightly darker skin than these people. <laughs> yeah, and the Crusaders reacted late, 
they reacted late. They weren't even jumping the gun on it. They, I mean, the Muslims made quite a bit of progress before the Crusaders even went in on them. And so, like, yeah. uh, the idea that the Crusaders were just committing a war of aggression against, uh, aggression against these poor innocent Muslims just... Jewish lie. Exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm, 50, I'm 50 pages into this book, and this has already been going on for generations, literally. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah exactly. all these people who are like, yeah, 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 you white Christian terrorists running around with this stupid asshole, I'm going to have a, I'm going to have an apology march for the Muslims. Fuck you. I'm so sick right. of these people. So to actually, uh, you know, so as one of the examples of, you know, look, I don't like being in jail. But, you know, whatever it is that you're in the middle of, ladies and gentlemen, try to turn it to your fucking benefit anyway, right? That's, that's I guess, what I'm, uh, that's the moral of my story here. It's like, okay, if I've got to pace back and forth in this cell, I, I, can do, I can do more than hate people and be fucking pissed off at the system. I'm going to educate myself and I'm going to do some push-ups, you know? Absolutely. And, uh, that's, that's the thing. It's just to put things to your, uh, to put things to your uh, to your benefit there, and I got uh, somebody else sent me on you know, Monday. I got to swap out some of these books. I don't know if I mentioned this part to you. The guy from Property came by, and he's just uh, he's like, I got like fifty books back there for you. So you know, I can't let you have them all in your cell. There's fire codes about this shit. So I've got to I've got to swap out some of the books that I've got. But somebody sent me another one. I think um, Solitary Fitness was just uh, somebody mentioned in a letter that I got today that he sent me that. And Let me I'm ask you this, would, would you be able to have, like, uh, headphones or something that plays you audio, like, in your cell? I have, I have, a, I have an AM, FM radio and earbuds that I bought from Commissary, um, but I can't, like, what, you know, I can't have, like, a, you know, an MP3 player, you can't send oh, me CD man. or whatever. I well, want to be I'll able to send what. you audio from the Internet Angling, for example, just debated Vox a day and... Both of them are awful on economics, but there are points that were brought up, and it would just be great to get your comments on it. That, that, that does sound like something it. fascinating. You know what I would tell people to do? It's probably, it's probably hopefully I'm out of here before uh, this becomes practical for you to do for me. But uh, broadcast.lrn.fm. That's broadcast.lrn.fm. LRN as in Liberty Radio Network. FM as in like you know radio. Um, Ian Freeman, for whatever uh, whatever flaws Ian has in terms of policy, is a very smart guy, and he set up this page where you can uh, he has uh, links to buy the equipment that one needs to set up a pirate radio station. And uh, I would not suggest that somebody do this illegally. You should, of course, go and get the licenses. But Ian doesn't explain how to do that at broadcast LRM, LRN.FM. He just explains <laughs> the technology. And you can set up a radio station uh, if you are somebody who lives in proximity to a correctional facility. That's a fine place to broadcast political propaganda into, especially if it's hate-filled and racist. And so I would strongly suggest that people learn more about how to do that sort of thing and then immediately go and find out how to do it legally because we're being recorded and monitored. Sure. Yeah. Yep. So anyway, but that's uh, that's that's about what I'm up to, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a, it's been a pleasure chatting with you as it always is, my friend. Uh, you want to do this? Uh, you want to do this again tomorrow? I'll give you a call sometime in the evening. You can give me a call anytime tomorrow. I'll be home all day because it's Sunday. All right. All right, fantastic. I am looking forward to it. And ladies and gentlemen, again, once again, I will remind you, ChristopherCantwell.com slash donate. I take the take the bitcoins and I take the uh, I got the Patreon up there so you can use your credit cards and whatnot. We are working towards getting uh, the store back in order. That might take a little while. We've got to figure out payment processors and a lot of other things. It wasn't exactly planning on being in jail, so getting all my affairs in order has been, uh, shall we say, challenging. Uh, but uh, I have some wonderful people helping me, as you're seeing, and uh, we will be back. We will be back tomorrow, if not sooner. Thank you very much for the, <laughs> tuning into the Radical Agenda. Have yourselves a wonderful evening and good night.